Day and night, Israeli warplanes dropping bombs on Gaza. The people here have no place to go. As in previous wars, Israel says it's responding to attacks from Hamas here. But the war this past summer was different, at least according to a surgeon working here in the operating rooms in the Shifa hospital, Dr. Mads Gilbert. This is a genocide, this is a massacre and I hope that some is being held accountable for it. Israeli impunity has gone so far now that they think they can do whatever with whoever, and they don't consider Palestinians even humans, according to how they treat them now. After voicing his indignation, the Israeli response against Dr. Gilbert has been swift. When he returned to Gaza recently, the Israelis stopped him from entering the Palestinian enclave. So what did he actually see in that hospital last summer that affected him more than in the past? And why is he convinced the Israelis are out to stop him? We'll find out as Dr. Mads Gilbert talks to Al Jazeera. Dr. Mads Gilbert, welcome to Talk to Al Jazeera. You've recently been banned from entering Gaza. What happened? Well, I went back to Gaza after the last uh, attack in uh, July, August. I, I went back in uh, October to follow up on the medical work, uh, research, teaching, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, patient care. I was invited by the Palestinian Minister of Health, and I was uh, having valid uh, Israeli travel documents, uh, multiple entry permit to go to Gaza for half a year. And who and stopped they, you? They stopped they me at the, at the gates to Gaza, and I asked why. I have everything, you know. I never did anything wrong. And they said it was a security issue from the higher security authorities, and I was denied access. What, security against you or what you capable me. of doing? Against uh, me. It was hard to know. I called my embassy and my Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, has uh, been working very hard on this issue, and they've got the formal response from the Israelis that I am not allowed in for an infinite time frame. And they say that I've, had, I've been in contact with uh, dangerous people, i.e. the Hamas leadership. And, and have you? Well, of course, I've talked to the uh, Minister of Health, as I would do if I went to work with, with any uh, medical system uh, in Out a different respect, country. Out of you would have to go of through. Course, of course, of course, of course, I would. And uh, I've been working with the Palestinians since 1981, and I've had contact with, uh, you know, Yasser Arafat and his brother Fatih Arafat, who was the leader of the healthcare system before the Oslo Treaty. So I think this is only a, sort of a, an excuse. I think the reason why is actually that I, I bring out the narrative of the Palestinian people in Gaza, the numbers, the facts, the pictures of the wounded, uh, what is really the sharp end of these attacks, which are, you know, being repeated over and over again. There's but why would they do it now? I mean, the Gaza war is over. Obviously, there are still ongoing incidences. But why would they stop you now when you've told pretty much your tale? I think you have to ask the Israelis that question. I, I don't have a clue, really, because I think if, if they considered me a security risk, why would they allow me to go in so many times? I think, uh, maybe if I should speculate, I think that the, uh, the situation for the Israeli government and the reputation of Israel on the international scene now is so damaged by these repetitious attacks, and in particular the last one, which was extremely uh, horrible, uh, that they don't want these tales to get out. They don't want the Well, numbers. what are they worried about for, for these tales getting out? Because there's nobody really to reprimand Israel, is there? So. What do you think their concern th is about? I think the concern is the public opinion. I mean, there is a growing uh, uh, concern internationally among ordinary people. You have the, the growing uh, boycott, divestment, sanctions movement all over, growing very strong in the United States, also in Europe. And uh, people are questioning uh, this uh, one-sided support for Israel through the years. And people are questioning the Israeli narrative of what is going on. You know, is it really uh, Israel defending itself against the Palestinians, or is it Israel attacking a besieged and, and occupied people, which is the other narrative? And I think they don't want any, any facts to get out, actually. And what, what is the truth? I mean, you've been there for 30 years now, I believe. As you said, you were there for the last war. 
What is it that you saw? I mean, who is it? Can you blame one party? Well, I don't think it's a question of blaming. I think it's a question of being realistic and be factual. And, and the fact on the ground, the facts on the ground are very clear. This is not a difficult conflict. This is a difficult occupation. And the Palestinian people have been under more or less severe Israeli uh, rule, a military rule, for the last close to 70 years. And it's getting worse and worse every day. Uh, the apartheid uh, elements in this rule is more and more clear to people. And the uh, military attacks on Gaza, uh, four since 2006, have been extremely unbalanced from the perspective of using proportional force. And you see it in the numbers. I mean, they killed 2,200 uh, during the last attack, which lasted for 51 days. Among them were 521 children. Now, if you ask yourself the question, what would have happened if the Palestinians would have killed 521, God forbid, Israeli children? Uh, on the Israeli side, uh, 74 were killed, among them four civilians and 66 uh, soldiers. One child. That is one child too much. No Israeli child should get killed, nor should 521 Palestinian children get killed. Do you think the Israelis have a right to be frightened? I mean, there are some Israelis, particularly in the Ashkelon area, who suffer from a barrage of rocket attacks. I mean, there is fear there. Should they be frightened? Well, uh, I think you should ask them. I think the, 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 the real situation on the ground is that the Palestinian people are trying to defend themselves against an oppressor, an occupier who is using immense military forces against them again and again, killing thousands of Palestinian innocent civilians and children, maiming uh, tens of thousands again and again. And if you look at the share numbers, the share numbers do not uh, indicate that they should be scared on the Israeli side. Last year, six Israelis were killed. It's the lowest number since 2000, actually. You talk about the disproportionate force mm. against the Palestinians, knowing that there's been a lot of criticism about the way Hamas and Hamas's leaders behave, the fact that they do get involved in family situations. Now, as you know, Gaza is, is a very uh, densely populated place, so it's probably hard for them to operate without of, you know, um, in, in, in a more secure area. So they've been accused of using Palestinians as human shields. They've been used, they've been accused of being provocative, attacking the Israelis, knowing how Israel would respond. Is there any truth in that? No, that's again, that's the Israeli narrative. That's so well propagated in the West that everybody believes it's true. It's not true. Uh, I'm not a military person, I'm a medical doctor. But um, I see what's happening on the ground in Gaza. They have been under siege for seven years now. They're lacking everything. Food, water, uh, rebuilding of bombed uh, uh, residential areas, building uh, schools that have been bombed, uh, water pipelines, sewage systems, everything. And there is a chronic malnutrition. This is the true attack on the civilian population in Gaza. The fighters, the resistance, the Palestinian resistance, is trying with their quite uh, simple and meager weapons to defend an occupied population. And according to international law, an occupied people do have the right to defend themselves, even, even with weapons. So I, I think it's turned upside down all the time. Okay. And if you look at the share numbers, there is no doubt that those who are taking the toll are the Palestinians. Now, to the, to the blame or to the accusation that Hamas is hiding, there is absolutely no proof that Hamas or the other uh, fighting fractions in, in Gaza are using human shields. On the contrary, there are numerous uh, proven facts that Israeli forces are taking Palestinian civilians as human shields. So all the time we are being, in a way, uh, fed this Israeli very efficient uh, storytelling about all oh, little poor Israel being attacked by the Palestinians. It's not true. It's the opposite. What do you make of the fact that there, there's a new front now in this war, isn't there? I mean, it's moved from just Gaza and rocket attacks, and now we're seeing these face-to-face -face attacks in places like Jerusalem, the heart of this matter. What do you think it means? Well, I think the Palestinian population, both in the West Bank, in Gaza, and inside Israel, and not to forget in the diaspora, in the, in the camps in Lebanon, in Syria, in Egypt and Jordan, they are increasingly impatient and desperate because the oppression has been so much uh, increased 
Uh, and what we've seen lately, now only the last few days, with the new law making Israel a pure Jewish state, this apartheid system combined with a, with a huge military machine makes people do desperate things. I'm against any attack on civilians, be it from either side. I condemn that totally. But again, the narrative is that the Palestinian people is under severe, extreme uh, forces being, being, being occupied and oppressed. So, so uh, what you see at an individual level, I think is it's hard to, in a, in a way, predict what's going to happen because people are under this immense pressure. But I think the solution is quite simple. It is to find a political solution, not a military solution, to lift the siege of Gaza, to stop the bombing of Gaza, and to find a just peace. Before we talk more about the, uh, the political solution, I mean, Israel often says that it needs to take this action in order to contain the Palestinians and to lower the threat level. Does that happen or do you create a possibly more militant society if you keep hitting them the way Israel is? Uh, listen to your words, contain the Palestinian people. What is that? To contain uh, a people, to be an occupant, it's illegal. And, and I, as I said, the occupied people have the right to resist. We were occupied by the Germans for five years. I make no comparison with the Israeli state and, and, and the German state, but occupation can be compared to occupation. And our heroes today are the ones who fought the occupation with arms. So of course, with, with this increasing pressure on Gaza in particular, I mean, they have been besieged for seven years. Now, Egypt has also closed the border in Rafah. And, and the situation inside, it's 1.8 million people. And more than 1 million of them are children and youngsters. The average age in Gaza is 17.6 years. This is a child ghetto. And what amazes me when I go to Gaza is that they are not more desperate than they in fact are. That there is so much calm, so much organized society, and so much discipline and humanity in Gaza. Yeah, because I was going to ask you about the psychological impact mm. of this continuing onslaught, the fact that you are basically in an mm. open-air prison. Mm. I mean, so many children have seen their parents, their friends, their, mm. their relatives die. What does that mm. do to you? Well, uh, the harder you boil them, the harder they get, pertaining to your previous question. Yep. Uh, and of course, this is a very consolidated people. Uh, when I was there during the last attack, and mind you, I used the word attack mm. deliberately, not uh, war or conflict. It was an onslaught. It was a one-sided onslaught on a people who are not even allowed to escape the fighting. If they really wanted the Israelis to have a man-to-man -man fight between the military fractions and their own army, why don't they open the siege and let the civilians fly? They don't. On the contrary, they diminished the area of Gaza by 25%, and they condensed the population even more. And there is nowhere to escape. There are no safe place. There is no shelter. And, and of course, psychologically, this will make you either more consolidated or panic. And I think that the, the family values of the Palestinian families, you know, they're extremely coherent. They're very supportive of each other. Uh, the belief, Islam, and the, the larger cause of a free Palestine uh, binds them together in a way that is hard to understand when you're on the outside. But on the inside, you're, you're struck by this, uh, I would say, humanity, this warmth, this uh, coherent way of, of uh, supporting each other. And this time, I really heard so many times inside Shifa Hospital, people saying, the cleaners, the paramedics, the doctors, the nurses, we are all part of the resistance. I was going to ask you, uh, I think you spent something like 51 days in Shifa Hospital. 15 days so of the 51. Right, OK. Um, I want to know what you saw and mm. how people operated mm. and how doctors operate then mm. and how they operate now. It is quite impressive. I think the, the doctors and nurses and the staff in Shifa Hospital, which, which is one of many hospitals in Gaza, are among the most experienced when it comes to disaster medicine and war casualty surgery. And bear in mind that they have been uh, affected by the same siege. They lack disposables, sutures, drugs, instruments, you know, renewing of the equipment. Everything is lacking. I actually made a report for the UN just prior to the attack in June this year 
uh, describing this very difficult situation. Actually, Schiffer Hospital cancelled all planned surgery by mid-June this year because of lack of resources. The staff has not been paid their salaries, normal salaries, for one year. And then came this attack on top of this extreme exhaustion of the civil society. Uh, and they managed. They worked around the clock. They improvise. They never give up. Uh, they come to work despite the fact that they have no salaries. And they know that their families can be uh, destroyed, killed, their houses bombed. The way Tell they... us about what you saw there. I mean, you saw many children. I was looking, flicking through your book. I mean, some of the yeah. pictures are, are heart-wrenching. I mean, that must be awful for anybody to... Yeah, to have to horrible with. injuries, lots of uh, shrapnel injuries because the Israelis were shelling with heavy uh, Horowitz uh, uh, artery shells uh, producing these uh, razor sharp heavy metal fragments that go straight into your body. One body could have like a hundred openings causing bleeding, uh, amputations, lots of traumatic amputations, burns and a large amount of children, half of the injured and killed were women and children among the around 12,000 killed, three and a half thousand were children. And as I said, 521 children were killed. And many of them came to Shifa. And of course, these are scenes you don't want to see. I'm fairly experienced in war medicine, but this last attack on Gaza was my absolute worst experience ever in my life as a doctor. And I can hear my voice start shivering mm. because it is, it is almost beyond description. And I, I, I'm happy you, you, you haven't seen it because you don't want to see these kind of things. Yeah. And, 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 and you, you keep thinking, this is 2014? Yeah. Is this real? The world is looking at, and, and this military army, supported by the US, is allowed for 51 days and nights to bomb an incarcerated people, which is a civilian population, not allowed to flee, uh, you know, denied all protection from the international society. International humanitarian law, the Geneva Convention, all the declarations of the rights of children and women and civilians, blah, 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 blah. The world is sitting idle, like a duck, watching Israel massacring thousands of what, Palestinians. What do you think the world can do? I mean, I think Sweden's the latest country that says it'll recognize Palestinians' bid for, for statehood. Uh, would that make a difference? That's sort of a, a nice move, but it's not, you know, I don't think it's affecting uh, Israel and the current government much. I think what is important is to learn from the fight against apartheid in South Africa and Rhodesia and, and the fascist regimes in Spain and in Greek and these times where we did international peaceful political boycott, divestment and sanctions, you know, to put a, an economical pressure. And it was weird to sit in Shifa in June and watch these atrocities and at the same time listen to the news that quickly there were imposed sanctions on Russia because of what's happening in uh, Ukraine. So the world, the Western world, do have the sanction tool, which is a peaceful and legal political tool to tell rulers that we don't accept how you are treating the other people, the occupied people, or what you're doing. So I think that uh, the, the international boycott, sanction, and, and divestment movement is a very forceful tool, and I, I wish more governments could uh, join in on that. But how do you get these players to talk? You've got massive divisions within Hamas. I think people are very concerned the way Hamas reacted after the war when they punished some people. Uh, listen, the public, listen, yeah. All right, okay, uh, so there's that happening within Hamas. You've got Hamas not speaking to Fatah. You've got the US and the Egypt who are not considered honest brokers. How do you get everybody around the table to come up with one roadmap that they all agree on? Well, let me just repeat. Hamas was elected in 2006 in a democratic election imposed by the quartet, Russia, US, UN, and EU. They won a landslide victory. They got a majority of the seats in the Palestinian parliament. They made a coalition government with Fatah and PLO that was shot down immediately by US and Israel. Then came the siege, then came the four repetitious attacks on Gaza. Now, on the 2nd of June this year, they made a new coalition government, Palestinian coalition government. Netanyahu has been saying all the time that we can't talk to the Palestinians because there are two uh, camps. It's Gaza and it's the West Bank. Mm -hmm. Now they have a unified government. And what does uh, Netanyahu respond to that? We can't talk to them because they're terrorists. I mean, uh, the West keeps repeating the Israeli narrative. In fact, the Palestinians have been offering negotiations, talks, all the time, and they have been offering ceasefires. 
you know, in Islam there is a type of ceasefire called hudna, which means an infinite ceasefire between enemies without solving the sort of fundamental uh, problems, but agreeing on a, a long-standing ceasefire. The Israelis don't want that, because at the end of the day, what Israelis want is to get rid of the Palestinians, because political Zionism today has a goal of establishing the land of Israel between the River of Jordan and the Mediterranean, and obviously where, where there is no place for the Palestinian people. So well, the, all the time the Western media keeps repeating the Israeli narrative. This is a whole different story. It is the story of how to get rid of the Palestinian people, and we need to realize that. Because the longer it takes, the more land the wall snatches and the settlements take. So you wonder what sort of Palestine you're going to be seeing in 10 years' time. Of course, and, and you know, um, I think, again, you should ask the Palestinians, and uh, most of the Palestinians I talk to, my fellow doctors, the nurses, the others, they say that the two-state solution is dead. It's, mm. it's shot down by Israel mm. because they have split and cut the West Bank so much up that it's going to be some small bantustans and we're never going to accept that. So I think we need to move out of that track and see that this is another question. This is a question of a massive uh, apartheid state regime that the Palestinians cannot accept and we cannot accept it and there need to be a political solution on the ground. Do you think there is an appetite for a political solution in the region? Do you think there's appetite to increase sanctions in order to, to stop this travesty from continuing? Well, I don't care so much about the appetite. I care about what is right and just. And it is unjust and it's not right to oppress a whole people the way the Palestinians are oppressed today. Uh, it is uh, inhuman. It is against international law. It is against any moral law. And I think history will, will in a way, uh, judge how we behaved. Remember what happened to the Jewish people. Don't forget that the West turned the back to the growing uh, apartheid against the Jewish people and the horrible things, the horrible things that happened during Holocaust. That was not the responsibility of the Palestinian people. They have always been actually protecting the Jews. There has been a good relation between the Muslims and the Jews in North Africa and in the Arab world for, for centuries. So this new situation, I think we need to understand that what is going on now is, is, is a gross injustice against a people who are trying their best to defend themselves and to survive a regime which has so much military power, so much political power, so much propaganda power that the world is keeping echoing the narrative of Israel and totally forgetting the Palestinian people. You've spent 30 years living and working with the Palestinians and you've, you've been in out countless times. What is it that Palestinians want? What do you think they would like to see? They want dignity. They want a just solution. They want to be left alone and live in peace, as all of us do. And what they say in Gaza is, you know, stop the bombing, lift the siege, treat us as humans, include us in the human family, protected by international humanitarian law, open the borders, and we'll be fine. We will not need relief. We are very industrious people. We will build up. Every time they have built up, they're getting bombed again. Every time. 2006, 2009, 2012, 2014. Bombed, crushed, not only people, humans and, and children and women, but their factories, their fishing boats, their schools, their pipelines for water and sewage, the whole civilian society. It's not an earthquake, it's a man-made disaster, 100%. Uh, planned, executed, directed by the State of Israel, by the government of Israel, with the support of the US, and it has to end. Is there a light? Can you see a light? Yes, the light is the increasing support in the international community for the Palestinian people. And bear in mind, I don't support Hamas, I don't support Fatah or PFLP or any other factions. Fractions. I support the Palestinian people and their right to resist an occupation, which is long time overdue, it's unjust, it's very bloody, and it is a shame for the Western world that it is being allowed to continue the way it is continued with these attacks and the siege of Gaza. One third of the children in Gaza are malnourished and stunting. They are too short for age from a chronic malnutrition. And as I said, half of the victims during the last attack were women and children. One third of the killed were children. I mean, who else would get away with this? What is it that, that allows this impunity to go on for the state of Israel? Totally exempt from international law, totally exempt from all moral laws, and it seems like uh, the West is totally paralyzed in some way. A combination of guilt from the Second World War, and yes, they should have guilt, but it should not be paid by the Palestinians.
Well, you might not be allowed in the country, but uh, it's good to hear your story. Thank you very much for talking to us on Talk to Al Jazeera. Thank you so much. Thank you.